So we should finish up our fishes today. We have two things left to finish talking about. Uh, the first of which are some feeding mechanisms. So we spent Friday talking about mouth types um, and how this sets up feeding. So really we just want to talk about some of the ways we go about actually doing of the feeding. Um, and then the very last thing we want to talk about is sarcopterygii, right? Up to this stage, we've been very focused on actinopterygii, our main osteopenic diversity group, because we do want to make sure we give honorable mention to sarcopterygii, one, because they exist, um, and two, also because they are very important um, from a group standpoint. Um, so first things first. Let's go ahead and talk about feeding. Okay, so um, there are multiple stages that go into uh, feeding or the acquirement of food in fishes. And so we're going to go through this in a multi-step process and look at what is the variation that's occurring at each of these stages. not want to be on today. All right, so stage one, if I'm going to go out, I'm hungry, right, I need to acquire food. What's the first thing I need to do? Okay, first thing I need to do is recognize what is food and what is not, right? So we've talked about this a little bit, okay, so what are some of my senses that I can use to recognize food. And so we talked about this in our life in the water a little bit. So <clears throat> things like taste and smell, right, can help us with this, right? So olfaction is our sense of smell, right? Gustation is taste. <clears throat> if you've not seen these words in, before, right, we've talked about audition. It, this is Hearing, okay, so things like our otoliths help us with a better sense of hearing. Okay, so collectively, right, we can use any of our five senses that help us sense and scout for a variety of prey types. Okay, now, ultimately, we have two major techniques at our uh, disposal to go looking for prey, right? And this is going to depend on what type of fish that we are. And this is one of the things that we're going to be looking at in the lab as well. Okay, so if I'm going to be looking for food, I can either, right, one, right, the first little bullet, actively go looking, right, search and detect. Okay, so I'm going to get up off the couch and go looking. Okay, so basically active hunting. Or two, could camouflage and wait, be more of an ambush predator, okay? Hide myself under, under the sand, okay, and wait for that prey to come to me. We're largely going to see as we go through the rest of these stages, okay, that we're going to be able to break out the diversity of techniques into these two kind of larger subgroups, okay? Am I going to be active about my feeding strategy? Or am I going to be passive? Okay, so am I going to the food or is the food coming to me? All right, so step two. Okay, once I've recognized food exists, okay, so whatever it is, is a food item, I can eat it, it is sustenance and nutritious, then I need to go after it. Okay, chase it down. Okay. So once again, we see this broken down into two pieces. Okay, how do I pursue or chase down my prey in order to acquire it? Okay, so once again, we see my top choice, type 1, is active. Okay, simple, straightforward, chase that yummy food down. Okay, so I'm just going to use straight up speed. Okay, simple, no frills, high speed, highway chase.
Okay. So any fishes that we see that are pretty generic looking fishes, okay, are going to fall under this. Okay. We're going to get to look at quite a few of these. That generic fusiform shape is going to do this. I happen to have a mako shark up here because it's pretty generic looking. Okay, but any of our trouts, right, that are going to fall under this. Okay, so our video from lab, if you've watched that already, that middle body shape, that rainbow trout, perfect example of this sort of thing. Right, boring, standard, fusiform body shape. Okay, nothing special, no frills, no bells, no whistles, just fish looking. Okay, we can make ourselves more, right, we see in this first blue box, right, more water or hydrodynamic because we can tuck our fins in right to the side and become more torpedo shaped. And that's about the extent of it. Now, type two, okay, is to. That was you? Okay, just making sure it wasn't me beeping up here. Yeah, I heard you talking over okay. <laughs> Type two is we're going to do something to be sketchy. Okay, again, what can we do to make our food sort of come to us, at least for part of that stage? So this is what we mean by trickery. So I have several different versions of what this can mean. And you see here we have a lot of variety with trickery. Okay, so this breaks down into what we call lurking and luring. Okay, so <clears throat> lurking, for example, and again, this might even look familiar if you watched our lab videos already. So here we have a lurk. It's a great word, underused word, right? Basically means I'm an ambush predator. All right, so I'm going to hang out. I'm going to hide myself a little bit. Okay, answers are not on your phones, guys. I see like four of those out today. Okay, I'm going to hide out. I might be in the dark. I might be under some rocks. I might be under some sand. Okay, I'm going to wait for someone to make a big mistake. Okay, my prey is going to come by. Okay, and then I'm going to burst out of the shadows. And so we see here a much more exaggerated body type. Okay, it's elongated. Okay, so we'll see this in class. My nose is skinny compared to our normal fusiform. Right, my body is long and skinny, so I'm very, very hydrodynamic. Okay, this allows me to get a very snap speed start. That prey item had no chance to get away. All right, so I've ambushed them. So this is what I mean by lurking. Right, comparatively, I can lure them. And there's a wide variety of what lures look like. Okay? Ultimately, I'm going to put as little effort into this as possible. This is what I mean by energy saving. Okay? So even angler fish is a good example. That's our big orange one here. Okay? Kind of fishes we see from like Finding Nemo or SpongeBob SquarePants, okay? Right from the big crevice. You have the little lantern fishing lure that you just dangle, okay? Make your prey come to you. Literally lure them into your mouth, okay? Thanatosis, if you're not familiar with this word, literally means to play dead. That's what we see this cichlid doing here. I'm going to play dead along the side of the road, so to speak. Okay, and then something that would normally be like a scavenger, okay, small crab, a small fish coming along to pick my bones is going to come by, check me out, okay, fatal error. Okay, and then become my dinner, mwahahaha. Hi. So one way or another, right, the key here is in both cases, the prey is very close to me. Okay, whether I've sped up and gotten close to it, 
or I've brought it in type 2 close to me, right? Tucking our fins in, right, so we can bring our fins in close to our body to make ourselves look like a torpedo. Okay, so I recognize my prey, I see food. Okay, one way or another then, I get close to my food, that was stage two. Okay, so stage three then, get food in mouth. Okay, so capture food. So we've talked a little bit about this stage in pieces over the last couple weeks. Okay, so getting and keeping food in our mouth okay, has a variety of methods, okay? In this case, we just want to get the food in our mouth, okay? So we have a couple of steps that we can use to do that. We talked about protrusable jaws on Friday, right, at the very end of class. Okay, so here we see that again, okay? So remember, this is really common with things like our... Um, Cardiform teeth, right, with those smaller type teeth we saw in things like our bass, for example. Okay, so here again we can really see, probably better than the drawing I made at the end of uh, our uh, lecture on Friday, right, the extension of that mouth. <clears throat> and so remember the big deal with these protrusible jaws is normally when we're in the water, right, and we're swimming. The act of that motion forward normally is going to push whatever's you forward. Right? We kind of imagine dropping a ball in front of us in the swimming pool, and as I swim, moves that ball in front of me forward. Okay? So the protrusible ball or the protrusible jaw system, right? Remember, opens up that vacuum. Okay? Creating this vacuum system here. Wow. Right, to help suction in the space that's in front of my body. Okay, I don't want to push that ball away. Okay, I want to suck that ball towards me. Right, I want to eat that ball. In our analogy, I'm working with it. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to open up this cavern. Right, creating an empty space in between us, a larger empty space. Okay, both reaching out towards the ball, okay, and creating suction, so pulling that ball towards me simultaneously. Also, very cute. All right, so that's one thing we see happen. Of course, not all fishes do this, okay, but it's very common. The other thing that we've seen, okay, so another thing that we can use is once we get in the mouth, we have what are called gill rakers. <clears throat> so you guys got a chance to see these a little bit when we started well ripping the heads off our fishes. A delicate way to say that. Okay, so here, all this pink stuff. Right, are the actual gills, okay? But these white things, and here is what they look like in our Mexican gray perch, right? These way back sort of stabby bits. <laughs> she really wants to engage in class today. Uh, are what we call gill rakers, right? So these front edges here, are those small teeth that we talked about at the end of Friday's class. Okay, but we see that we have sort of stabby bits in the kind of back of the throat area as well. Okay, so we've seen these before, and these are what we call gill rakers. Okay, so these are very common. 
in fishes that are eating either smaller things like planktons or fishes with smaller teeth, right? So they're going to be eating smaller organisms or those organisms are probably going to get shredded a little bit as they go down their throat. And so the key here with these gill rakers is, remember, we take things through the mouth and then swallow and water gets pushed out across the gills, right? Everything we do has this motion. And so as we right, push water out across the gills, anything large okay, or angry or fighty okay, is going to get caught going through these gill rakers. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay. So one, okay, if it's still alive and fighty, Right, so if I've gotten a particularly, say, large insect, that insect's going to get caught on the gill raker and not damage the gills. So that's important. Okay, plus, I've now caught the food. Right? It's food that's been caught here instead of escaping through the gills. Okay, so this is doing a double duty. It's helping protect our very important respiratory organs. Okay? It's also helping to collect any additional food that is trying to escape across the gills instead of going down the throat where it's supposed to. Did prey ever like get to the stomach and it wasn't still alive? Because it seems like they like are like swallowing stuff because like remember their teeth are like still being alive. So the question is, can prey potentially get to the stomach while still being alive? Theoretically. That's terrifying. Right? So <laughs> fish are quite small. So the pathway from the, uh, the mouth to the stomach it would be quite short, although most of the time they would probably suffocate or get injured enough between the mouth and the stomach that they would probably die along the esophageal pathway. But in some cases, there's nothing actively killing them before they get there, short of suffocation. Any questions so far? Okay, and don't forget, if you're online, I can't see the chat, so you need to pop on your mic for a hot second. Okay, so as a fish then, we've seen food, okay, we've gotten close to food, and we've put the food in our mouth. Okay, so now, okay, we need to get the food down our throat. Okay, this is what we call processing. <clears throat> okay, so how do we actually get the food down our throat and into our stomach? Okay, so remember... 90% of the time, we're not doing any kind of chewing, okay? That we talked about that a little bit with piranhas, right, with their triangular teeth, right? Their goal is to shear, and they do have very specific teeth that allow them to do that. But most of the time with fishes, and as we'll find with most of our animals going forward until we get to mammals, chewing is not a thing that happens, okay? So... How is it then we're getting whatever meal that we're getting, and most of the time as big of a meal as we can get, inside our body? Okay, so there's several different options that we have, um, and most of the time we're using as many as possible. Okay, so the first thing we want to take into account here is most organisms, particularly when you're dealing with fish, the key is... We need to eat them head first. Okay? And this is another thing that we'll notice this week in lab. Okay? Now the key with this is that's because having fins is really problematic for going down your throat. Okay, so again, if you watched your lab videos this week already, I made a little bit of light of this right, with the, the bird gif I stuck in there. But it is a serious problem. right? If I'm trying to swallow something, 
And as a fish, if I don't want to go down, the first thing I'm going to do, stick everything out that I got, right? Even better if I've gotten something stabby on me. Uh-uh, no, not going down, right? So the only way as a fish or as a bird that's trying to swallow me that they're going to be successful at that is if we're going to be able to depress right, or push those fins down, right? Think about like when you pet a cat, right? You got to pet it so the fur gets pressed nicely. We want to put it all in the same direction. Same thing with our fish. When we swallow our fish dinner, we want to be able to pet its fins. We want to push it all down nice in the same direction, right? So head to tail. And we kind of have a memory of this when we were dissecting. We would be really careful how we held that fish, okay, because if you went the wrong direction, you were going to get fins and spines stuck in your gloves, okay, tear your gloves, maybe poke yourself, so we had to change gloves. Same thing here, okay, when they're handling their fish, we're going, they're only going to be able to go one way with their mouth, okay, or they're going to get stabbed, stuck, okay, and maybe not get dinner. Okay, other things that can be done, okay, and this is a pretty common thing in the animal world too, okay, beat it. Okay, so you can grab fishes either by the face or the tail. You smack them around a little bit, which feels weird. Okay, this is common. You see birds do this with things like bees and stuff as well. You just smash them on stuff. Okay, so... See a big fish? Take a little fish, okay, and you can smash them on the rocks, or they'll pick them up, pull them out of the water, and smash them against the shoreline. <laughs> kind of funny to watch. Okay, but the key here when you do that is it'll smash the spines off. Okay, or if their spines do have toxins in them, right, the panic will often make them excrete the toxins in the battle of the smashing against the rocks, right? And you can't excrete toxins infinitely, right? There's usually a lag period before you can release them again, sting a second time. Okay, and in that lag period, then, our predator can then swallow their dinner with very little fear of getting stuck in the interim. Hi. Lastly, we have what's called gape limitation, a.k.a. how big is your mouth? Okay, so gape is wide. Okay, so the idea is we can only eat, they can only eat something that's the same size or smaller than their own mouth, right? <coughs> So 90% of fishes, right, are dealing with that issue. Okay, so if the fish is bigger than them, then they won't eat it. Now, we already did talk a little bit about some fishes that ignore this, right, our piranhas, for example, that can shear flesh, right, by either cutting or what's called death rolling or rotational feeding, right, I can bite onto you and then spin. Okay, which helps tear, particularly for fishes and reptiles and amphibians who have very poor cutting teeth. So in that case, the physics force is doing most of the tearing. Okay, but these two are fairly uncommon okay, relative to the broad scale of being able to tackle food. So they do happen, worth mentioning, but again, if you were to default to how are fish eating, okay, a very small, less than 5% majority to how do fish consume food. <coughs> oh, yeah, so when I went to look up Fishscape for a picture, the first 15 pictures are this crap. Right, so it's like the duck face. So apparently fish face and fish lips is a whole like 
model like Instagram posing thing. I was very frustrated. So I guess if you're very into the whole selfie culture, this makes sense to you. <laughs> I apparently am too old to get that one. Also not super sure what squinch is, but it's a whole thing you do with your eyes, I guess. Got it, thank you. <laughs> if it weren't for the hair, right? All right, any questions about fish feeding? <clears throat> or its connection with anything that we talked about on Friday, right? Teeth and um, mouths and all of that. Movement, body types, all of that. All right, so let's finish up our conversation about osteoxies by hopping over to the other subclass, right, or class, Sarcopterygii. Okay, so remember, Actinopterygii, right, makes up about 99% of the total diversity within Osteichthys. Sarcopterygii, where's a good graph? There we go. Makes up a very small proportion, even though they evolved largely around the same time. For the most part, the extant or living species are very minimal, making up about 1% to 2% of the remaining osteoxies. Okay, in fact, there's only like two groups left. Okay, if you've heard of them, the lungfishes and the coelacanths. Okay, so very, very teeny. Okay, used to be a ton of them, okay, during our very important Devonian period, okay, which we know is the age of the fishes. Okay, so these guys look like fishes, okay, but at a glance we can immediately tell there's something super weird about them. Okay, so when we say there's very few of them, we mean it. Okay, so there's only about 13 of these guys in total. Okay, so remember there's 25,000 osteoxies. So really these guys are making up a very small proportion of what are fishes. And most, gracious, excuse me, most of these being freshwater. Okay, the coelacanths are those that are marine. These are very disjunct populations. For example, our two coelacanth species, there's one outside the coast of Africa and one outside the coast of Asia. These are not clustered groups, right? They're kind of all over, okay? The reason these are kind of cool to look at and pay attention to, and we can immediately see, pointing, get used to this. Okay, what kind of makes these guys interesting is the interesting and unique features on these guys ultimately give rise to our tetrapods. So tetra being four, right? And pods, limbs. Okay, so the unique fins on these guys, as you might imagine, lungfish, right? So fish literally having lungs, give rise to the four-limbed creatures that now walk on the earth. Right, so this is the lineage that connects land and sea, which is super cool. And there's just not a lot left of them that still live in the water anymore. So we're going to take a peek at them, take a look at some of the cool, unique features, the ones that are still hanging on, and this is going to give us the great chance to start talking about our transition to land. Okay, so Sarcopterygii, okay, we're Actinopterygii, okay, meant ray finned fish fishes, okay, so remember it was like having the bendy hands right up against our body. Sarcopterygii means lobe finned fishes, okay, and so that comes from 
So here's our ray fin, right? Sort of having that flexible hand. Lobe fin comes from, right, having these little, like, stick-like arms included in their fins. That's where the lobe part comes from. So lobe or arm-like fins. So this is significantly different than anything we've seen before, right? This isn't serratotracheal um, versus lepidotracheal, right? Is it stiff or is it bendy, right? This is an entirely different shape. Okay, so if we look at this versus this, right, this is our, I did not, right, our ray fin on the right, right, our sarcop on the left, okay, so the key is this extra lobe bit. Okay, so we still have the fin part, right, the black lines that's making the finny thing. Okay, but the lobe part, okay, or the arm bolt that in there is what's making these guys special, okay. And this provides them a lot of strength and flexibility that we didn't see before, okay. So remember the key behind the ray fin fishes is by having all this bendiness, it gave them a lot of cool stuff that they could do that shark skates and rays couldn't do, right? They could sit on the ground, they could build nests, right? They could handle rocks, they could do all sorts of cool stuff. And we'll continue to see that in lab this week. Okay, but they still were sort of stuck because even if they were going to, like, pick up a rock, they just have, like, these little hands to move around with, okay? These guys have a lot more flexibility because their hands are now, like, out on little arms, okay, with multiple bones, many of which match the same developmental pieces that we see on our arm and leg bones, okay, which is the coloring that you see here. Okay, more importantly and more coolly, what gives them like really effective motion is their paired fins, right, so our pectoral fins, for example, move in a synchronized fashion, meaning they move at the same time. So when they swim, it looks very similar to like running in cheetos or in horses, right? So it moves Together. I can't do it myself, right? In a business. So it looks like a galloping horse or a running cheetah. Where the front legs move together and the back legs move together. So it's a very synchronized paddling motion. So they can move quite quick and turn quite quickly, like we would imagine animals can. <clears throat> okay, and again, what we know here, right, the more bones that we have. Just like before, we had more vertebra, okay, and the more bones we had in our vertebra, the more muscle connections that we can have to that, okay. The rule's still going to be here, okay, so we have more bone connections in our little arms and legs, okay, which means we can have more connections with muscles there. So we can also have stronger fins, okay, so stronger motions then in our fins. So in the water we don't, um, but some. So her question is, can they use their fins to catch prey? Um, so in the water we don't, but some of the lungfish on land can. Um, in the mud. Okay. So there's two uh, subgroups of these. You're not, I'm never going to ask you for the taxonomic terms, so don't stress about things like actinesia. Okay? It's just there in case you're curious. Um, so these guys are the coelacanths. Right? Remember, there's two groups. Um, <clears throat> these are our coelacanths here. Okay? These are pretty much the only guys we're ever going to talk about that have our fourth type of tail. 
So we talked about proto-circle, homo-circle, and hetero-circle. Those are the three most common types of tails. There is a fourth. I often cut it out of our photos because it's crazy rare. This is the fourth type. You rude little thing. Okay, called diphocircle. Okay, it's unique and that it allows our coelacanths to live in a very unusual way, right? So here we see our coelacanth sitting in what's called the handstand, right? So it basically allows them to sit upside down, kind of motionless. And this is how these guys hang out. So we see that they're nocturnal piscivores and heaters. Mm -hmm. I'm just disruptive today. <laughs> you are really disruptive today. And so these guys are ambush predators. Okay, and lure predators. So they would just hang out like this in the dark and wait for their unsuspecting victims to swim underneath them. It is a very weird type of fish and a very rare one. Okay. And for the most part, in my lifetime, this fish was thought to be extinct and then, like, was rediscovered again. Wouldn't it be really hard to call something extinct in the ocean since we kind of found that, like, discovered, like, well, so this is sort of the key is like when you go without seeing something a long time, right? You just call things extinct. And we spend so much money on science and exploration, right? So. And I think when it comes to fishes, it's if you don't see something as part of fishing and fishing bycatch for a very long time, that's a lot of whether fishes are considered extinct. Okay, so, and here's a closer up of that coelacanth, so you can see how absolutely gorgeous it is. <laughs> okay, because there are only two of them, right, this is considered, right, the most endangered group of animals in the world, given that the one, right, the one that was rediscovered, right, since I have been your age, um, is critically endangered. Oh, I guess it exists, but there's, uh, there aren't that many of it. All right, so let's take a look at the lungfish. Also very cool. Hey, again, you do not need to know the taxonomy. Okay, that's only there for those of you who really, like, that helps. I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to ask that. <clears throat> okay, so this is the other group. As you might imagine, their name comes from the fact that they have lungs. Okay, so these guys are an example of our obligate air breathers. Okay, so they need to come up for air. And so for once, I've given you for our first image, right, an actual dissection of these guys. So you can see that instead of having things like swim bladders on the inside, we have actual lungs on the inside. So they've converted their swim bladder, right, a bistostomal swim bladder, okay, into one that exchanges oxygen. Mm -hmm. okay, so this is their big kick. So these guys would normally live in sort of like muddy ponds and the like. Okay, and these guys are pretty hardcore too. Uh, so most of these guys live in areas like Southeast Asia. <laughs> right, and given that they live in muddy ponds, for example, they get caught up in like the mud bricks that locals, for example, make into their houses with, and they can live there in those mud bricks. So if it rains really hard, for example, um, you can see sort of a mass exodus of these guys coming out of stasis being released from these mud bricks and then just sort of like scooching through the slime and heading back to the ponds from the mud bricks and all these huts. 
This is a very, very tough fish. Um, let's see. Let's just make... Okay, this will finish up our osteic piece. So on Wednesday, we will pick up um, looking at transition to land. Okay, so uh, what do we need to live successfully on land? Right, and just like what we talked about life in the water, I started that right, okay. What are the challenges to doing so? Okay, I also have a review game, okay, a fairly big one. Um, for dealing with all of our sort of life in the water kind of business, largely our osteic piece because we have a lot of moving parts. Um, so I'm going to pop that up. Okay. And I'm going to leave it running all week for you guys. Okay, as always, when you are all set, my back two rows can go. Please have a fabulous day. I will see half of you this afternoon, or we will continue to finish up this conversation. Everyone else, you can go. Please have a very good day. I'm sorry, did you say a car caught on fire?